Hello, and welcome to our channel, MarStream, your public performance broadcast platform. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also donate to our tip jar and support the arts and artists of MarStream by clicking the link below in the description. Check out our website, themarsh.org, for all upcoming live performances. Now, enjoy the show. Namaste, greetings to all. Recently, the Prime Minister, the Assistant Prime Minister actually, uh, remarked that the only good mouse is a dead mouse. Well, he was referring to the mouse plague that is happening in Eastern Australia. And obviously he was very, very annoyed at all the mice there. But I have a different take on it because I grew up with a lot of respect and love for the mouse. You see the mouse or mushika as it is known in Sanskrit is actually quite a lovely creature. And it is the vehicle or the mount of Ganesha, our very popular Hindu god with an elephant face, a trunk, big flapping ears, and a rather chubby human body. And how did the Mushika or the mouse become his favorite vehicle? Well, it goes back to a story from our mythology where there was this very uh, strong god of music who one day accidentally stepped on the toes of a holy man or a sage. And sages those days had a temper and they were also very powerful. So immediately the sage in his anger cursed the god and transformed him into a giant mouse. This mouse started wreaking havoc and Ganesha, the god who was the remover of all obstacles, stepped in and he took the mouse under his wing or his ear and he started working on the mouse. He first of all downsized him from a large creature to a small cute mouse and he made him his vehicle, always keeping him under control and close to him. So we see images of the mouse sitting very reverently by Ganesha's foot, often sharing the treats that are given to Ganesha. And also we see the mouse balancing the big Ganesha on his back. Well, here is another story. It is said that Ganesha used to go to the temple and receive all the worshippers all day long. They came asking for blessings and Ganesha was happy to give them. And he would listen to all their problems. And in return, they would give him offerings, his favorite round sweets called laddus, which are balls of goodness. And Ganesha had to eat them to please his worshippers. He would keep eating and eating and it turns out one day he ate so much that his stomach became huge and he became very sleepy. So he got onto his mouse that night and started heading home. It was a bright moonlit night and those days every night had a full moon it is said. And Ganesha sleepily sat at the back as they went through forests and mountains and valleys. And suddenly he was startled because a snake got in its way. And the mouse became unstable, lost its balance. And Ganesha fell off the mouse and started rolling down a slope. And as he rolled, his stomach burst open and all the goodies started rolling out. The bright moon was watching from above and was very amused. <laughs> His laughter echoed all over. And Ganesha, normally very mild-tempered God, 
saw the moon laugh at him, got really agitated. He broke one of his tusks and he hurled it at the moon. And the moon was struck and immediately turned blind and everything became dark. This was very unusual. And the gods came to Ganesha and pleaded with him, asking him to bring moonlight back. Ganesha wanted to teach the moon a lesson, so he did it in small doses. Every day he would make the moon brighter and brighter and brighter. And this became the waxing and the waning of the moon as we know it today, according to Hindu mythology. Well, in my mind, only the mouse could be this loyal, faithful helper of Ganesha, the remover of obstacles. But some people say that Mushika could also refer to a bigger rat, maybe a bandicoot. Well, I grew up in tropical Madras and I did encounter bandicoots there. In fact, a family of those were living in my grandma's backyard, probably under the swaying banana trees. These are bigger, nastier versions of rats, very greedy and rather fierce. Well, they would creep up late at night through the door, the back door grills of my grandma's home. They would squeeze their fat bodies in and land up in her storeroom or pantry. They were sacks and sacks of grains and peanuts that she got from her village. And granny suddenly noticed that somebody was ripping through those sacks and there was evidence of grain strewn all over along with droppings. Well, granny one day went behind the door and stayed vigil there. Then she saw two fat bandicoots come in and help themselves greedily to all that grain. She tried chasing them with a broom, trying to get rid of them, but they kept coming back. Granny then got these two big traps and she also made her favorite snack, what we call vades in South India, fritters better version of falafels with more spice and onions and chickpeas. And she made a bunch of these which we kids loved and couldn't stop eating. But she saved a few as bait for those bandicoot traps. And she fastened them by the hooks. And guess what? The next night the bandicoots came and they didn't care for the grains anymore. The smell of the vades was enticing. So they quickly grabbed them and got caught in the traps. Granny stood triumphantly enjoying her victory. And she got her gardener to take these bandicoots in sacks and release them far away. And for a few years, they didn't come back. Well, the other theory is that Mushika can also be the bandicoot's cousin, the rat. And I beg to differ because I have not so pleasant memories of the rat from what my mother told me. I believe when she was around four years old, she and a bunch of her cousins were sleeping on the floor on mats one hot summer night. There had been a wedding in the family and it was full of guests. And it turns out that one rat actually crawled on her and bit her foot. Yes, the foot of a tiny child. And even today, after 80 years, I can still see the scar on my mother's foot. So how can I forgive that rat and say that it could be a vehicle of Ganesha? No way. Also, they were much more cunning than the bandicoots. 
my grandma would make the same fritters and suspend them in their traps. But they would grab the fritters and make an escape and merrily come back the next day for more. Well, I thought when I moved to this country, I was leaving behind all these pests. Rats and bandicoots and mosquitoes and cockroaches and lizards that would haunt us. But that was not entirely true. A few decades ago, when I lived in this big suburban neighborhood, behind actually a security gate, I encountered some pests. Yes. Every night I would hear the loud knocking behind one of my kitchen walls. And it would keep me awake. I would go with my flashlight looking for it. I would look for holes, but there would be nothing. I would knock back at the hoping that they would respond and quieten down, but that got them even more agitated. And then the mystery was solved when I opened one of the drawers with all the treats I had recently brought from India, including some spice powders that we mix with our rice and eat, some fritters, some wafers, I noticed that those had been tampered with. Something had gotten into those thick plastic, well-sealed bags and I saw evidence of pieces of all that around and droppings, those dreaded droppings. I knew I had to do something about it. Well, I first tried setting a spring trap and I put some cheese in it. I was not going to make those fritters like granny, no way. But the next day the cheese was gone, but nothing else was in the trap. Then I noticed a big long tail disappearing under my fridge. So I set a sticky trap there. Yes, the next morning, lo and behold, was this big mouse. Not a mouse really, it was a rat. Yes, happy to say that. This rat sat like that looking almost dead, but its tail was still wagging. It was gray and it had pink undertones and it was totally stuck. Well, my daughters wanted to release it, but how was I to release something from that sticky mess? So I just tossed it behind our slope and I knew that it would make a nice juicy lunch for a bird, a hungry bird. Well, I just hoped that the family of the, that rat wouldn't come looking for it and hoped that they did not have a taste for my delicious Indian goodies. And thankfully, they didn't come back. So this was just one brave and adventurous rat at work. And soon we moved out of that neighborhood but today, when I read about the mice and all the havoc they are wreaking in Australia, I, I am torn. On one hand, I feel badly for them because they are super hungry. They have been multiplying like crazy and they need to eat. So they are getting into the homes and barns and, you know, finding food. But on the other hand, I know that they are becoming pests and hundreds and thousands of them are going to be killed with very toxic poisons that may also impact birds and other nature. And I think that is terrible. So I would like to appeal to good old Ganesha, the God who removes obstacles. Ganesha, I know that the mouse is very beloved to you and you and the mouse have been inseparable. So could you please intervene and do something about this? After all, the mouse, the mushika is your vahana or vehicle. So please do something soon.
Namaste. Thank you, Rupa, for that wonderful performance. Now let's welcome our final performer, Emil Amak Guillermo with Death to the White Filipino, excerpts from Amak Monologues. This is my normal. Uh, I'm in Zoom mode doing play-by-play -play of my life like a stadium reporter. The Filipinos have taken the floor. Uh, not sideline, but I, I am in my, my gong closet. Uh, my Amak Monologues are an hour solo show that I do pieces made from stories of my life. True stories, true stories. And, and let me just say this. I host the PETA podcast. I am pro mouse. Definitely pro mouse. But these stories here that I'm going to tell you tonight want to be part of those amok monologues. Um, one is uh, my gay driving job. Uh, the other is about meditation and Memorial Day. And... Uh, this one is Death of the White Filipino, an elementary tale. I'm in San Francisco in the 60s, 22nd and Chattanooga, you know, right there. That's where Edison Elementary is, 22nd and Chattanooga, a nice name for a segregated city in the South. But we're in San Francisco, which would like to appear to be a little different from Chattanooga. But in fact, San Francisco and Chattanooga in the 60s had a lot more in common with each other. 22nd in Chattanooga, down at the bottom of the hill, the slight hill, 22nd in Dolores. It's Dolores is that special street in San Francisco with the palm trees. And you can look from the schoolyard, look out on Dolores Street, and you think, I'm in elementary school paradise. Oh. Elementary school paradise, yeah. And I'm eating my lunch, and my, my friends have stolen my Granny Goose potato chips. My Granny Goose, not Laura Scudder's Granny Goose. And they're playing, they're playing keep away with my Granny Goose, but give me my Granny Goose potato chips. They took my Granny Goose potato chips. It's keep away, but for me, it was monkey in the middle. I grabbed my potato chips give me that, and eat them. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see the new kid. It's a guy named Audie. Black kid, first black kid at Edison in the 60s, came off the yellow bus in the morning. And I see him and I didn't have enough potato chips to offer him. But uh, before I could talk to him, my friends say, hey, Audie. He's named after Audie Murphy, the World War II vet. I guess that's kind of appropriate on Memorial Day. And then, do you want to play a game? And then Audie just shakes his head and say, okay, great. We'll play tag and you're it all the time. And we do things differently here. When you're it, we chase you. And they chased him around the schoolyard and he, Audie was fast. We couldn't catch him. He was just so fast, but it would just, it just seemed kind of ridiculous. So we were chasing Audie around the schoolyard. He was getting tired. And I said to my friends, uh, do you think that this is fair? I mean, they, they said, Mia, look, he's having fun. He's, he's fast. Look how fast he is. He's really fast. Look, keep running, Audie. We're going to get you. And, and they chased him, and Audie kind of got the hang of this, and he said, I, I don't like this. I'm going back to the projects. I'm going to get my gang, and we're going to come back here. We're going to kick your ass. And he left, and the projects down there on Army Street, which is what Ch Cesar Chavez used to be called. There were some projects there. He was going to come back with an army of friends. Oh, man. So me and my buddies walk home from school on Chattanooga Street, of course. And we're walking and I'm kind of scared. I, I say, I, I asked my friends, friend one, friend two, and friend three, we'll keep them anonymous to protect the innocent. I, I said, why did these black guys hate us white guys so much? And they just looked at me. Uh, friend number one uh, was the first to take a stab at this. Uh, Emil, uh, you know, you're not, you're more kind of a brown, brown color, you know, like a, a deep brown. Uh, maybe not a gong brown, but uh, like a, a deep brown. And, and then friend number two said, yeah, like uh, a golden, golden bear brown, like Oski the bear. He was partial to Cal. Oski the bear brown. And then friend number three, who the toe haired kid who was, you know, I was, he was first clarinet. I was second clarinet in band. I thought he was my best friend. He said, no, Emil, you're, 
You're more like poo color. Poo brown? Winnie the Pooh. You know that kind of yellowish brown. And, well, I just kept looking at my hand the whole time we walked home. You get up to 21st in Chattanooga, and then you go into the tracks. You live dangerously. You know, you dodge the streetcars. You pass Liberty. You're getting onto 20th Street. And then they go to the houses up on one side of the tracks. And I went down toward Mission Street. But my consolation, I get that great Dolores Park view of the world, all the whole Bay Area, the whole city. At that time, there were no big buildings. It was all like, looked like a hatless San Francisco, just like all flat. Oh, it was brilliant. Just, it just looked like a regular town. And then I'd go to my flat that my family rented. We were just always renters. And my mom was doing her thing. She had a gig where she made doilies and sold them and she made lumpias from the wrappers the whole bit she made lumpia she was the lumpia queen and she made wrappers she had to make a thousand wrappers for a party and she'd start off with a turned over cast iron pan over a pot of boiling water she'd take some flour and she'd like brush it on the bottom of the pan and the steam would steam up the perfect white wrapper the white skin of the lumpia they call it balat the white skin she make a thousand of them and then once they were cool she would take the the filling and she'd roll it up wrap it up in these little thick fingers cigar type things and then she'd have another pan filled with oil they got so hot she'd dip her finger into some water and when it when it went like that, pss, the water she dip her fingers and pss, when it did it three times, it was like hot enough to flash dry. And she'd take the Olympia and she'd pss, put it in ten, se ten seconds aside. Pss, 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 pss. Perfect Olympia came out golden brown, uh, sort of like this. And she put it in the side, and my sister and I would look at those Olympias, and we'd want to have some. And she said, no, that's where they parte. You get those over there. And she pointed to another plate of Olympias, kind of worse for wear, a little, little browner and maybe burnt, a little black in them. Crispy, but kind of black. My sister grabbed one, started eating one. I grabbed one, started eating one. She grabbed a second, started eating it. I grabbed a third, a second, started eating it. She grabbed a third. Oh my God. I grabbed a third and I said, mom, can I trade this for a good one? Why? Uh, I want to bring it to school. There's a new kid. He could use Olympia. So, uh, I think that was the beginning, the beginning when I discovered my Filipino-ness and I was no longer a white Filipino. Uh, in the full amok monologues, I talk about going to Harvard and doing a lot of crazy things. But uh, this second story, I'm on Zoom, where else? A Memorial Day service, it was yesterday, my friend Corky Lee, he died in war, no, no, he died in the COVID or just think there's about like 500 and what 590,000 have died from the COVID war out of all wars 650,000 in all of history have died from war we're almost there we I don't know do you know many war dead I know more COVID dead than war dead Corky died of COVID, January 27th. Oh, who was Corky Lee? Cor Corky Lee, I don't know. Do you know Asian American history? He was at every Asian American event. He was the unofficial photographer laureate of Asian America. He was there with his camera, his lens. He put the, the Asian Americans, the Chinese American railroad workers back in that picture. Oh, you know, the, the picture at Promontory Point, the, the, the railroad workers are joining hands and there, there's a railroad and, you know, railroad here, railroad here, and they're, they're joining hands. And in that whole picture, there are no Asians, no Chinese workers. And Corky had a Woolworths 
over his magnifying glass and he could tell there, there were no Chinese. He put in the Chinese. He went every May 10th on Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month to stick the Chinese back in that picture. That's the kind of guy Corky was. He's my friend. I love Corky Lee. He made me do more, see more, say more. My conscience. That's why I emcee that event. There was Reverend Toshikatsu Nakagaki who kicked it all off. He had a Buddhist prayer and meditation reflecting on Corky's life. And he said how life in the West is more like a, uh, you know, a straight line, but in the East, Eastern cultures, it's more like a circle, you know, in a circle, uh, Reverend TK said, when can you can come back, you know, right? You can go and then you come back right there and you could feel it. You're together and then you're gone and then you're back again. It's a circle. It speaks to me because I am proud to say I'm an independent meditator. Now, this is news for someone who likes to go, his middle name is Amok. He's meditating now. Amok? Well, mindfully, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think this is progress. Um, amok has always been just a metaphor, but meditating means I'm quiet. I, I want to be the Johnny meditation seat of the world. I mean, you know, it's so easy just to shut up and pay attention and be happy. <sighs> I can help. In fact, I sit in front of my TV, eyes open, because I'm an eyes open, standing up, no prisoner of the cushion. I'm a stand up meditator. Yeah, a stand-up meditator. And if my jokes die, that's okay. If you don't laugh, I'm a meditator. Silence is golden. I love the silence. And my TV news is part of the practice. I watch it to build resistance to the world, not get caught up with the push and pull of life, to be focused on the present, to see through it, to essentially care bear stare. Care Bear Stare, but I'm um, an older guy. I mean, you know, meditation is better. Care Bear Stare worked when I was younger, raising kids. But then I'm watching TV and there are these mass shootings, mass shootings. I see Paul McGee, a Filipino like me. I see him in San Jose at the VTA. That could have been me. Paul McGee was supposed to be in Disneyland this weekend celebrating his son's junior high graduation. And they would be driving back, having a good time, his three kids, his wife, Paul McGee was living the life, an immigrant's tale. He came here as a toddler in the, in the 80s. The 80s came here as a toddler. His father came here. They, they were waited for their turn for the visas and father and son are like best friends. And I saw the father on the news, Leonard, Leonard McGee saying, it's the worst news you can ever get. The call that your son is dead. And all because of one man, one man, a man named Samuel Cassidy, an angry white man who was well off, had a $100,000 job, but he hated his job, he hated his work. He was militaristic, had his semi-automatic weapons, three of them had like fired off like 39 rounds. And he like got, went, went after it, sort of like methodically, skipping over some, killing others. Found Paul McGee. Paul McGee, a victim from a mass shooting the war within American society. I start to feel kind of a muck to match Cassidy's a muck. And I'm wondering how do I deal with these non meditators? You know, the non meditators with guns. I mean, I, I consult my meditation teacher who says, Emil, you're going through an intermediate phase. That's what he says. Get over it because where this is leading is we are all one we are from the same source 
and we have all a lot more in common with each other. We are practically siblings. That's going to take a lot of meditation. I mean, I, I'm tempted to say screw meditation or maybe let's up the Care Bear stare. I mean, I, I start to get a little angry. The last four big mass shootings, 12 Asian Americans have died. Atlanta, Indianapolis, San Jose. 12 Asian Americans have died. Maybe my teacher is right. Maybe we're from the same source. Maybe we're siblings, if not one. Is it any different from what the Christians say? Love your neighbor or to the extreme, love your enemy? Now, the dead ones are easy. A lot of, uh, but they cause so much pain. So I'm thinking today we, we should honor the dead. Today, not just the war dead. We should honor the dead, the COVID dead and honor the dead from the war of modern American life. There are 239 mass shootings in the US. That's where three or more of dead are, are, have been killed. That's as of May 31st, we're not even half over the year, 239 mass shootings. And last week, a Filipino, Paul Magia, one man, Sam Cassidy, did it. I wish I could have taught him some meditation tricks. Maybe the Care Bear Stare. All I know, San Jose didn't have to happen. Many of you know that I'm Asian American, Filipino. Uh, these storytellers who I've appeared with today, they're part of an Asian American Storytellers in Unity group that I'm also a part of. I'm also a part of an independent group because we know that, you know, groups just don't like me being part of them too long. But I love, I love uh, Rupa and Mio and, and all the others. Uh, we do storytelling shows everywhere. This next story, well, it's also, this is the last day of Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, a nippy hymn. Right? A nippy him, a nippy, a nippy him, a nippy, a hippie him? Wouldn't that be in a Gata de Vida by Iron Butterfly? Uh, no Iron Butterfly fans here? Okay. Uh, a nippy him, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. That's the full name. Joe Biden signed it on the proclamation. Let's go with it. The Native Hawaiians have been screwed. Let's include them. But this is the last day. This is the last day we can say it up until like midnight. And then it's Gay Pride Month, June. And for that transition, I want to tell this story. It's uh, driving while gay. I'm in a play in Boston in the, the 70s. I, I get to play like white guys in black theater. And sometimes in white theater, when it's non-race specific, I just play the generic guy. I'm a chorus member here. It's mid 70s. I'm in this play. We're waiting in the wings. and I'm talking with the other cast members, these other chorus members, Andy and I forget the other guy's name. And I'm excited because I'm going to Cape Cod this weekend. And I tell, hey, I'm going to Cape Cod this weekend. Oh, yeah. Well, well why are you going to Cape Cod? Well, I, I got this job as a driver. Oh, you, you took that job, Emil? Well, yeah, I went to the job. We had college or at the job board. I, I, I went to the job board, didn't say, said, driver wanted. Emil, that's a gay job. It didn't say gay driver. Emil, I had that job last year. What, what, this is how you guys communicate? They didn't have Uber back then. And he said, uh, Emil, uh, I'm telling you, uh, well, I mean, he sniggered. Have fun. I said, he said I didn't have to wear the uniform. The next day I meet Roger who hired me on the phone and he said, yes, uh, I don't have to wear the uniform. I can just drive the car. It was a big car. It was a Cadillac. He's in Boston. We're going to go to the Cape. Let's go. I've never been to the Cape. At Cape Cod, I'll, we'll see the, 
we'll we'll see the foliage. We'll see. It, it'll be great. Uh, I'm driving, and just so there's no mistake, I say, "Hey, what about those Patriots? They're doing well, huh?" Yeah, go Patriots, football team. Uh, and he's a, a professor from another college, not the one I go to, but he uses the job board in my college. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah. We get to the house. It's a long ride, about three hours or so. We get to the house, and I see that this is not the first rodeo for Roger, although it is my first rodeo. And I see there are pictures all over the the house of people in costume, not the driver's costume, but other costumes and some rodeo costumes, but they're all having fun. And I can tell Roger still wants to have some fun. And uh, me, hey, I'm a young Californian, grew up near the Castro, bought film at Harvey Milk's Photoshop. So I'm open uh, to some things. Uh, so we get there in the house and he says, the saunas over there hot damn saunas i love saunas put on my bathing suit and a towel and we go in the sauna we're in the sauna sitting down and i can feel the heat just coming up and he's sitting across from me and we're looking at each other and i'm feeling the heat and it's really hot and i i just smile but say nothing and it's hot for me it must be hot for him and at some point he just says the beach is out there and he runs out to the beach and jumps into the Pacific. Oh, not the Pacific wrong side jumps into the Atlantic cools off and races back to the sauna. I just follow him. I jump into the water and go back in the sauna and sit down and we're both sitting soaking wet in the sauna, but it's hot and we can last another 10 minutes until we heat up again trying not to look at each other, but dripping wet and then dry. And then I say, the beach is over there. And I run out to the beach and I jump in the water. It's cool again. And I run back into the sauna and he is the same. And we come back and we're dripping wet again. I'm wondering how, how, how long can this go on? Surprisingly. A long time. I jump back in the water. I, I get cool again. And I'm thinking, I, I wish I could swim because then I could do something besides just dip into the water. But I run back into the sauna and I sit down. We're dripping wet. And Roger figures it out that, you know, it may not happen this time. We dry off and I, I guess dinner was supposed to be maybe something better than hot dogs, but that's we had hot dogs. Uh, I don't remember it as being anything special, but he then uh, repaired to his room and I repaired to mine and we called it the night. That morning, or the next morning, it was clear we should just head back to Boston. And we did. We packed up, packed up the uniform, closed up shop drove back to Boston. He said, look, Emil, uh, I, I know this didn't exactly work out the way we wanted, but uh, why don't we let bygones be bygones? And then let's just have a look. I'll invite you to a party. You can meet some of my friends. I guess he's thinking it may not be him, but maybe someone else. I'm a young kid in college. Uh, and I say, well, OK, sure. But I, I got a paper to write. But Tuesday, OK, Beacon Hill. OK, I'll be there. I'm writing a paper. It's a really big paper. I took an Asian course with Fairbank and Reichardt, you know, the ambassadors, China and Japan. I wanted to do something on the Philippines and there was a scholar. There were no books on the Philippines, but there was a scholar who said, you might be able to find something in Widener Library if you go deep in the stacks. And I, I did, I went deep in the stacks. It was like a mission. I was gonna find the story of my life, the story of my father who came to America in the 1920s from, from the Philippines. He was a colonized Filipino. What, what, was this, what were the circumstances of their arrival and what was the history? Well, they were, came in lots of um, ratios of men to women, 14 to one, because they were there mostly to work. They weren't there to start families. The women weren't there. Then there were anti-miscegenation laws to prevent the Filipinos 
from mixing. So they couldn't marry, they couldn't vote, they couldn't own property. It was all there. It's my history, my father's story. And I just thought he was just an awkward dude. It was discrimination. When Tuesday night came, I, I did enough work and written a first draft or a second draft. And I thought, I, I can afford to go to a party. I go to Beacon Hill and Beacon Hill, if you know Boston is, you know, it's a good thing I wasn't drunk back then because there's a lot of cobblestones and you're like, uh, you know, like floating around there. I find the townhome. It's a nicely appointed colonial. I walk in and it's like I opened up the closet of greater Boston. Here were all the top gay people in Boston, the CEOs, the politicians. Uh, Roger was a professor. He knew everyone and they were all there. The gay 70s of Boston, an underground that no one would see. And I think he just wanted me to see. Here we are, Emil. We're hidden, but here we are. And I saw Roger's friend, Whitney, who was the host. He looked like Ebenezer Scrooge when, you know, the good part of Christmas, Christmas Carol, you know, when they're happy. And he, he was like drinking and imbibing and um, everyone was tiny Tim to him, you know? Yeah. And then uh, I, I saw these two guys making small talk and they were, they were telling me that, oh, we've been together 15 years, but we can't get married. And guys had ascots and they just looked incredible. They were the captains of industry. This was Boston's closet. And then Whitney were, went up the stairs. He left the party briefly and he came back down. And from the stairs, he was wearing a nightgown, a long captain-esque kind of nightgown and a night, nightcap. And he waved goodbye to everyone and said, good night, gentlemen. Thank you for coming. And he went back upstairs and plopped himself down on his four poster bed as one by one, the members of the party went up the stairs to bid him farewell, to kiss him good night in a receiving line. Well, when in Rome, do as the Romans. I, I just followed him and everyone just, you know, like, they gave him a big kiss or a hug and it was uh, the old friends, right? Kindred spirits. And then it was my turn. And they had not invented the fist bump yet. Or the elbow bump. Or the chest bump. It was my turn. I just said, sign a peace. Whitney. Thank you for letting me see that the Filipinos aren't the only ones on the margins. I left the room, went down the stairs, went to the subway station to take the train back to Harvard. I was ready to write my paper, the final draft. I had all I need.